Welcome to another CHRO Conversation, hosted by the Center for Executive Succession at the Darla Moore School of Business. I am your host, Anthony Nyberg, and today we are speaking with Alex Taylor. Alex is the Executive Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Northern Trust. As a member of the Executive Leadership Team, she is responsible for the more than 35,000 employees. Previously, she served as the Head of Global Banking and Markets HR and GHR Regulatory Initiatives at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. In addition to her many accomplishments, she is also a proud alum of the Darla Moore School of Business. Alex, it's really great to have you on campus. Thank you for coming back here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. As I, I was telling you earlier today, it's been a personal goal to get more involved with the university, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So you are obviously super successful. You're the chief human resource officer of a major financial institution, but you got your degree in marketing and finance. How did you make that transition into HR? I, I wish I could tell you it was more deliberate than when it, what it was. Uh, that said, I, um, I was, in Columbia, South Carolina, I knew that I wanted to, to get back to, to Charlotte, North Carolina, and so I uh, started looking for opportunities, and the first opportunity that came was campus recruiting. And so that is uh, what really launched uh, my, my career in HR, and uh, it was truly, people often ask me, you know, what was one of my most favorite jobs, and it had to be campus recruiting because you got involved so early in your career with the business and figuring out how do you bring talent into an organization at a level that I could understand because generally speaking this was a peer group so uh, that that's how I got started and I can tell you already being back on campus as a CHRO you've done an amazing job of recruiting already now, our <laughs> students are now eager to well get to I, I, I'm eager too I, I was getting a little jealous when multiple people told me that they were at PepsiCo I was like wait a second we, we've got to get here too so I'm looking forward to it and then also your LinkedIn uh, profile states that people matter and so do results how do you, as a business leader, get that balance right? You know, it, it's a balance that I feel like, at least me personally, I have to work at every single day. I think you have to be really, really deliberate around balancing people and results. And so um, I try to actively listen. That, that's one way and really make sure that we've got an environment uh, in which people feel comfortable speaking up. That said, I think you also have to be really clear with where's the bar and what's it gonna take to chin the bar. And, and then also from a recognition perspective, you've got to reward not only the result, but also the effort. And so um, for me, it, it's a constant um, balancing act and making sure that I'm doing those things well, listening, setting expectations, and then rewarding both the effort and result. And, and you talk to the students a lot about the, the, act, the importance of active listening. Can you, in the context of, because you've now been there just not quite a full year. Not quite a year, exactly. <laughs> can you talk about what, what that active listening really means to you, and, and particularly as you're getting started in a role? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, and I, I don't know that I could have fully appreciated this until I transitioned to Northern because most of my career had been spent at, at one organization. Understanding a company before you propose change, I think, is so important in making sure that people feel heard and that the solutions that you're proposing are fit for purpose. And so um, what that looked like for me at Northern was truly 90 days of a listening tour. And I don't think there's anything novel about that concept, but I think when you join an organization as an HR professional in the midst of year end, finding that time um, takes discipline because it's so easy just to jump into your inbox, but making sure that you're carving out the time to uh, hear employees and make sure that those solutions that you're putting forward are in response to what you heard um, can be a challenge at your end. I mean, a lot of people talk about the importance of listening, but how do you how do you convince everyone in the organization that you're really hearing what they say? And, and I think, in particular, the finance industry has often not been associated with. Um, uh, really appreciating HR maybe the way some other industries. It's a really fair point, and I think um, as I think about trust. Um, 
trust takes time, right? And, and I needed trust quickly, right? So how do you start to develop that? And how do you start to find common ground with people? For me, at least, it, it's been a few quick wins, right? So how can you look at, you know, what is the entire universe of what you've heard? And then how do you start to prioritize that in terms of what uh, you could deliver quickly that will impact the most people? And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're doing um, is bringing back in-person um, uh, recognition programs and so it will impact a large portion of the population uh, but at the same time will enable a high performing culture such that we can celebrate good work. So th that's a really interesting thing about the the recognition of, pro of, of people that are excelling or doing something extraordinary and what do you think that does for the for a whole company culture because really only a few people each year getting these awards yeah. so what does that do more globally? You know it's interesting it, it <laughs> I feel like I'm on campus, so I'm going to use like the acronyms. Like it creates a little bit of FOMO, and and I I want that. I mean, I I want the the pictures on LinkedIn, and I I want people wanting to want to get that award. And so, um, if we can get the the social uptick uh, as well as um, ensuring uh, that that we're recognizing not only just for you know it should be for above and beyond your job, and and that's what we're really emphasizing this year with those awards is how do we recognize people who have gone above and beyond. And from just an organizational culture perspective, do you, do you see those kind of things as symbols really changing or making a difference or that people really recognize it? The company that I'm at right now, I mean, it's a, a company that's been around for you know almost 135 years. And so there's a lot of rituals about that organization that make it the organization that it is today. And so these awards are, are the highest honor that anyone at the organization can win. And there's a storied history of people who have won them. What we're doing this year that's a, a little different post pandemic is bringing it back in person so we can take that opportunity to get to know people in person. Uh, and then also, you know, opening the aperture such that people could self-nominate in addition to being nominated and so from an inclusion perspective that uh, has been very rewarding and we had a record number of nominations this year. And uh, financial in terms of particularly in terms of diversity and inclusion and women moving up and I know this is a important thing for you and, and you talked to the students about it a little bit today but financial institutions have often at least been perceived externally as even being more challenged particularly getting women to the top of organizations mm -hmm. etc. What is the, first, is it, should it matter? Should we be paying attention to that? And then second, if so, what are some things that we ought to be doing? Should it matter? A absolutely. I mean, we have to represent the communities and clients in which we serve, and that includes women. So um, I absolutely think it matters. And, you know, what I was talking to the students about today was, uh, the fact that I, I don't view, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion as, you know, as, as side business. I mean, diversity, equity, inclusion is something that we have to pull through everything we do to really change the hearts and minds um, and, and make an impact. And so what does that look like from an HR perspective? Um, it, it's integrating diversity, equity, inclusion through the entire value chain from, you know, attraction to development um, to, you know, creating alumni of the organization. And so we've tried to really Really embed those practices throughout. And I really liked uh, some of what, how you phrase it was that making sure that it's not people trying to check boxes, yep. but that they're really uh, taking this internally and that it's part of the, what they think to do. How do you change those hearts and minds that way to, to help everybody understand, again, particularly in a financial industry where it's often perceived as, no, it's just the bottom line, it's all the bottom line. Well, I think you tie it back to the bottom line, right? And so as you start to think about, you know, what does it take to win business? I mean, many uh, organizations as part of RFPs are asking for diversity, equity, and inclusion information as, as part of, you know, awarding that business. And so I think the more that you can start to tie um, those those measures to ultimately the, the success and, and the bottom line, uh, the more success that you're going to have. And now I know remote work must be a... <laughs> A torturous thing to even have to talk about now, because it is, but it's been such a big deal. And again, in the financial industry, not your leaders in particular, but that's where some of the, the more vocal uh, proponents of forcing or, or bringing everybody back into the office seem to be uh, pretty loud about it. Yeah. What's your, your take on the, on the general principle? Yeah. 
For us at, at Northern, um, we've elected to be in a hybrid environment. Um, that said, I think it's important to be where your clients are and, and to be flexible in that nature. Um, what we've heard from, from our partners is that is important to them to have flexibility. And so, you know, we're looking at flexible work arrangements the same way that we're looking at any other benefit that we offer. I mean, that's all part of the total rewards uh, value proposition that we offer. And then as a, a just my final question, so you are an alum of the Darla Moore School of Business, and we're, we're quite proud of, of being able to call you an alum. Is there anything you'd like to point to in terms of what th being an alum of this school or what you learned here that's helped you in your career? Well, first of all, thanks for asking that question because, you know, I, I was reflecting coming um, back to Columbia and it, it, in so many ways it it's where all of my relationships began and and I um, just think about you know the lifelong friends that I made at, at this business school and even outside of the business school in Columbia South Carolina that have you know built me up in times when I needed uh, support and have you know also just been there through you know ups and downs and um, that all started here and so I uh, think the collaboration that this business school fosters um, has just really proven to be a really critical skill that I've been able to deploy uh, across many different roles. Well, we're deeply privileged and pleased that you came back. So thank you, and we hope that you'll be on campus many times in the future. Well, I hope so too. Thanks for having me. You just listened to another CHRO conversation. Today, our alum, Alex Taylor of Northern Trust, shared her views regarding the role of HR as a strategic partner in driving business success. On behalf of all of us who are associated with the Master of Human Resources program and the Center for Executive Succession here at the University of South Carolina, thank you for joining us. <laughs>